I'm making this video for those of you who are considering the purchase of a original vintage carver amplifier or preamp or other product, or you're considering maybe refurbishing or upgrading. You need to know the pros and cons of this because I used to be a, a, a fair fanboy. I go back to the 80s when my first hi-fi product was a Carver M400. Little did I realize at the time that Carver made some dogs as well as some good stuff. Uh, Carver has equal parts, huge fan base, but also equal part detractors. And I can tell you why that is on both sides. I will try to be as objective as possible so that you understand what you're getting into when you deal with this. Okay, so I've already established the fact that I started in, it, it, with Carver in the late 80s. So it is out of nostalgia that I own this piece. This is a Carver M1.5T amplifier. The T stands for Transfer Function Modification. Everywhere you see the T appear against a Carver amplifier means that Bob Carver nulled it against some other amplifier to try to duplicate the sound. And he did that successfully, uh, according to a room full of audiophiles that couldn't really tell the difference. This particular amplifier is uh, nulled against a solid state Mark Levinson amplifier at the time in the 80s. This Mark Levinson amp was 30 thousand dollars and this amplifier was about a thousand and it pretty much upset Levinson and uh, the whole audiophile world when stereophile J Gordon Holt published the fact that people listened to this and they were dazzled they were they were damned if they could tell the difference between this and a thirty thousand dollar amp it's all about the voicing and all about the current transfer function so at that point Carver gained a lot of sales, made a lot of various products, through some through subcontractors in Japan, a lot of them in the United States, okay? And basically, I understand, because these amplifiers are cool running, they produce a lot of power, and they have a certain voice to them that kind of mimics, like, say, Mark Levinson, but... The rest of his TFM and TMON amplifiers were nulled against various tube amplifiers. So everything from Con Conrad Johnson on the way down the line, Carver has nulled his amps against things for many years. Okay, and so it went from, say, the M1.5T, the cosmetics changed, and the amps after this were just simply called TFM. Okay, so what this video is for is for people that are curious that it's not for hardcore Carver diehards and it's also not for car Carver haters. It's for those of you that really want to be more objective and, and more accurate as to what this entails. Okay, let me start here with this M1.5T. Originally, I owned one in around 88, 89. So, and I found that it did a number of good things, but then what are the downsides? Well, for one, uh, Carver knew his amps were not really stable when they're pushing a low impedance load. Like, I'm not talking about like a four ohm clips or clips horn or something that's super easy to drive. I'm talking like anything from Apogee, Infinity Kappa, um, on down the line, that like brick like speakers that need a whole lot of power carvers really weren't good at driving that uh the low four ohm later on when bob created sunfire he created a load invariant amp meaning that regardless if you put four ohms eight ohms or a difficult load on it it's not going to change the character because that's the one thing about these amps that you can tell when they're starting to strain other than when these led indicators light up uh indicating some kind of a clip the other way you can tell that they're straining is the fact that it doesn't sound like it normally would when it's driving an easier speaker load like an efficient eight ohms all of a sudden you'll get a, a recessed mid-range maybe some bass that doesn't sound right and maybe some rolled off treble so all kinds of things can happen 
when it's asked to do what it really can't do. That's why I want to steer people away from the rose-colored glasses type scenario where they think these amps are omnipotent because they have all this power. The TFMs are the same way, unfortunately. Just, if you don't believe me, try to drive a set of Apogee Scintillas. Try to drive Infinity Kappa 9 really loud. And if you don't blow up the speakers, you'll blow up the amp or both. So... Where does that leave us? Okay, I can give you a short list of Carver products that are not worth buying today. The original M400 Cube, as it is, had a very noisy power supply. And you could bridge it into mono, so you had about 1,000 watts per side. The problem with these things is, because they were noisy to begin with, uh, when they went into bridge mode, you could hear the hiss and the noise, and it was very prominent, unacceptable to me. I had one, got rid of it. Uh, unfortunately, maybe the mod or the upgrade may help that, but it wasn't until at least the T-Mod came along that they addressed some of those issues. The other product you want to steer clear of is the any of the Carver CD players before the Carver tube equipped CD players. The ones before that are not worth restoring uh, or owning because they're not particularly great sounding. The DTL 200, which I had, was pretty good, but they were a lemon and they would start skipping very easily and mistracking. Had all kinds of problems with them. Um, they had a high failure rate and the Sonics just weren't there. Um, the repair facilities, which I'll put up a link at the end, uh, will tell you exactly the same thing. The two primary carver repair facilities, and they also do the upgrades, in the on the west coast is high tech repair, which is Car Carver Audio Repair in Washington, and then you have Neilion, which is in Michigan. Both of them have outstanding reputations. They both do complete refurbishments, upgrade, recaps, everything that you can possibly do with these uh, amplifiers. Okay, the other thing that you don't want to buy, uh, Carver's C2 preamplifier. It's their cheap entry level preamplifier. I had one. They really don't sound that very that good at all. You can tell it's got serious sonic limitations on it. Uh, they tend to be very murky and not worth refurbishing at all. Stick with the C1 or the C4000 or the other uh, stuff in the Carver line, but avoid the C2. The same thing goes for Carver's TX2, their uh, cheapest tuner. It's really the Sonics and the tuning capability really weren't that good. Uh, the TX11 and 11A were fantastically better in terms of sound and capability. Those are worth refurbishing if you really still want terrestrial radio, which I don't. I had one, had it upgraded, and said, nope, I'm never using this thing. It's just not worth it. Radio sucks. It's all programming from Cleveland, and it's really terrible yeah, here in New England where it's rural and you, all you get is multi-path and weak signals and terrible stations. So I, anyway, that, uh, that got the heave hole. Uh, those are primarily it uh, uh, as far as the things that you really don't want to waste your money on. The rest of it can be fair game. Uh, what you're looking at here, the M1.5T, this is an upgraded model. So I want to tell you the difference between refurbishment and upgrade. Okay, let's say you uh, went online and you bought yourself a, an M1.5T. You know these things are like 35 years old, right? Okay, the one thing that this has in common that applies to all vintage products is they have electrolytic caps in the power supply and sometimes in the audio chain. Electrolytic caps, which don't even come close to meeting their own spec because they're usually the cheapest ones available, have this gel electrolyte inside them that in as little as three to five years, that gel starts to dry out and it degrades the sound. So after 30 years, you can imagine these things are, you're going to have at least 30% or more of a, of a decline in performance from when it was factory new. So at the very least, when you get these things, Look at a recap. The alternative, and I've seen it in person, is when the caps dry out, the elements inside will basically short together and the caps will blow and spread this purple electrolyte all over the inside of your amp. And it will probably take your speakers with it. 
So don't even don't even think about running these things for a long period of time. You may beat the odds and luck out, but at the very least, they all degrade in sound. And I've compared the tuner, the pre the C1 preamp, and this to when they were new and when they were refurbished and all of that. And I can tell you this that when I got my 1.5 off of eBay, uh, it arrived and I listened to it and it was murky. It was like it was playing from behind a curtain. The Everything, as I stated before, was rolled off and murky and dark sounding, very closed in. It couldn't even drive horns right at all. It was just worn. Okay, so what's the difference? Okay, so refurbishment means that they are taking the stock value and type of components and replacing the caps and anything else that's worn inside so that when they get done, the product will sound just like it did when it came out of the factory. There will be no alterations, okay? And by doing that, they're going to give you decades of hassle-free function because everything that's crucial will have been replaced for brand new. Okay, uh, this is a good route to take if all you're interested in is pure nostalgia and uh, the minimal expense and whatnot, and it's it's gonna it's gonna suit your needs. Upgrade. Uh, here's the big one. Upgrades are more expensive. Is is in order to meet uh, price points and the fact of the parts availability in the '80s, Carver used lowest bidder cheap parts to make these things. That's just the fact of the matter. They also used what was available at the time. Upgrades done by the, the two companies I mentioned before basically take all of the electrolytic caps completely out of the audio chain and replace them with 1% or 5% metal poly capacitors. Absolutely no electrolyte. They have lower resistance. They are much more neutral and just let the signal through. They replace the power supply capacitors with higher grade, like black gate or other uh, high quality electrolytic caps, which are better than what the factory used. They're closer to their value and they are gonna last you a lot longer. They also replace something very crucial that, that nobody seems to mention are the op amps. Op amps are the integrated chip amplifiers inside the amp. When they amplify the signal, the older ones have a more limited bandwidth. They had a slower slew rate, meaning that they could really what it sounds like is it that they could only reproduce something that kind of sounded a little bit soft, a little bit rolled off. They didn't quite have the transient attack or clarity of modern op amps. So these companies usually have their own proprietary op amps that they put in that are worlds better than anything used in the factory. The new op amps, as a matter of fact, will give you a sense of much better sense of transient attack, transparency, better bass. Everything will improve. So what's the downside of the upgrade? Well, I'll tell you what it is. The downside isn't just the expense and not being able to recoup that down the road, but it will not return the character of the amp to its original factory spec. What you're gonna get instead is a more modern, brighter, and more neutral sounding amp that does not sound original. This is not good if you're looking for the nostalgic original sound. It's also gonna affect the, uh, the, the carver haters because carver haters don't understand. When you change all of that, you have a completely new product that isn't a carver product. It is a brand new thing that sounds completely different and it overcomes all of its issues with the exception of the, the low impedance stability. The way you can overcome that, if you choose, take the new TFM, which have a different chassis and cosmetics, and Neilion will do what's called a Mark II uh, upgrade. Basically, I believe they put in a second power supply system. But when you get the amp back, they can not only notch up the power output considerably, but they can make it so that these things will drive magna pans and low impedance loads, 4 ohm and possibly even 2 ohm stable. 
it's something that the 1.5 and the older amps cannot be modified to do. Only the TFM series can do that. But just to let you know, that is a very worthwhile thing because you're still getting basically a Carver product, just hot rotted and again, a little bit more neutral and not as not quite as tubey sounding. Personally, for me, I prefer the upgraded sound by a long shot because I'm more about accuracy and clarity and dynamics, not so much an interpretation of a, of a, of a tube where the, the treble is ever so gentle and the sound is laid back and the transits are a bit softer. That, that doesn't do anything for me. Okay, so you're looking at the outside of the carver. Uh, not much changed here. You can actually get blue LEDs instead of the red ones here, which is really cool. I like that. You've got your rudimentary uh, protection. It's hard to see on camera because they used a light white gray on silver, but this here is your fault indicator. And against a variety of faults, it is rudimentary protection. Word of caution though, it is not like a modern amp. It is a slower system. Uh, it doesn't, it may blow a fuse, but it may also blow itself up just to save your speakers. Mine did, basically, uh, when the fault tripped for whatever reason, then uh, the amp, when it when it played in both channels, started producing kind of a, of a rumbling, crackling noise. And according to the uh, repair services, basically, that fault took out the power supply, which is common to both channels, did some damage in there. I'm guessing a filter cap or something that, that is meant, or a diode, uh, something that is meant to uh, keep the uh, power clean coming through. And that's, I think that's what I'm getting is a bit of a, of a, um, an issue with noise, uh, right, basically power noise riding uh, through the audio out of there. And it's, this will eventually get fixed. Uh, what else do they do? Well, something interesting is I turn this unit around, you'll get things that never existed in the original. Okay, these are upgraded speaker binding posts. The original ones are smaller and really flimsy. I never really liked those very much. The other thing that when you buy these old 1.5, they depended on the preamp, the C1 or the C2, to be plugged into acting as a switch. So you got no switch power switch on this whatsoever. So you can get the power switch installed along with a switch uh, the, it's a it's a soft start type switch, so it's not going to thump when you turn it on. So that makes it better than the original. Also, I have the IEC cable in there. The original was a captive cord that was built into the power supply. This obviously you can just swap out cables as it is. Okay, so in case you're wondering about buying any of these Carver products, just take into account what can be accomplished with it. You can either uh, restore it to original sound, which should be good for you, and and it'll last you for quite a while, and you'll you'll really really enjoy it for that type of investment. But I I urge you, absolutely get it recapped. Don't suffer the fate that will eventually happen. Uh, the other route, of course, like I said, is upgrading, and upgrading to me makes it much more of a modern amp. But here is the grain of salt that you have to take this with. Never mind the fanboys or the haters. Again, the upgrades will make this sound more neutral and more modern. But for the amount of money that I put into this to get it, to buy it, to have uh, it shipped from eBay, then shipped out to Washington, shipped back along with the upgrade costs and so on, that's well over $1,000 into this unit. Okay, for that price, I ended up buying the Emotiva XPA 2 Generation 3. The Emotiva is better than this right across the board. It's more neutral. It's got a dead silent background. It's got better power protection that comes on instantaneously, micro circuit controlled. And I like it because it's a more modern, neutral sound and it's more brilliant top to bottom. I think the transients are better. The dimensionality is better, really everything. So I no longer have that uh, hankering for, for Carver products, although I did have a good time with this. They are fun, and if you want to keep them, 
take one of the two routes, either refurb or upgrade. But have fun with them and check what model that you've got uh, before you uh, decide to go on one route or the other. Because, like I said, some of those products that I mentioned before, they are not worth your money and time to refurb. You'll end up spending probably on order of six times the amount of money that the unit will ever be worth if you just if you if you do the uh, upgrade to one of those units like the like the C two or the or the four hundred, but the other stuff, hey, like like Roland Barr at uh, Carver Audio Repair says, if you get this upgrade done, it should give you thirty years of trouble free and uh, better performance. So good luck with your choices out there. Get the right carver for your needs. You've got some tough-to-drive, stubborn, brick-like speakers, ATC, MagnaPan, so on and so forth. I would look elsewhere besides besides carver products. I would want something like the Emotiva or ATI or any number of uh, conventional amplifiers that'll that'll drive that load with less stress or or, or more control, I should say. Um, I got to be honest with you, even as though, even when I owned the original 1.5, the Adcom GFA 555 came out. Their amp and preamp was head and shoulders better than anything Carver made at that time. And they, they really were. Their conventional designs, minimalist approaches with no capacitors in the output of the, uh, the, the preamp and their toroidals, they just grabbed the bass and transits a lot better than these amps could. So... Forewarned and forearmed. Don't have rose-colored glasses for these, and don't be offended uh, because what I've given you is is objective, and it's from my direct experience. And I believe my experience will be reinforced through those repair facilities that you talk to. They will tell you upfront, no, don't restore that; it's not worth it. Or yes, restore this one or upgrade that one. They'll tell you what they can do, and it's quite a lot. So make your choice right whatever it happens to be. Enjoy your carver. Don't let any of the haters uh, dissuade you from that. Go go with your gut. If you're feeling nostalgic, get it refurbed. If you're feeling like you want nostalgia plus modern, get it upgraded and enjoy it for the rest of your life.